This is a photo of Anatoly Chubaish cashing out at some ATM abroad. Who is Chubaish, you may ask? Well, he is the one who led the privatization of Russia in the early 1990s, creating shady loopholes that brought about the Russian oligarchy. Chubaish then helped Putin into office and later promoted Russia's passportization policy, a tool for extraterritorial governance, military intervention and foreign policy. In other words, Chubaish is one of the socio-political architects of the Russian Federation. Aside from Putin, no other person bears so much responsibility for the Kremlin's jingoism and ethno-nationalism. No one understands Russia and its subtle inner workings better than Chubaish. He is also the highest ranking official to have defected from Putin's government and abandoned his country. So, what is the architect of the Russian state running away from? Presumably, the end of Russia itself. Chubaish is running while he still can. So, let's talk about that, because this is one revolution that will not be televised. Today's video is sponsored by Ground News. Conflict in Ukraine is still going strong, but most stories are confusing and inconsistent. I'm using ground news to cut through the noise. Look at this story about the contents of Biden's new weapons package for Ukraine worth over $700 million. It includes HIMARS rocket systems. These powerful, offensive weapons will help Ukrainian forces push out the Russians from southern Ukraine. The HIMARS are a potential game changer. However, this story is mainly covered by right-leaning media outlets. You can see that right here. Only 17% of the left-leaning audience will have access to this story even though it is of strategic importance. If you scroll further down, you can even identify the sources covering the topic and what political bias they have. This is interesting. One of the sources is the state-owned Russia Today. Just click on the icon and you will instantly access its bias ratings and ownership. These stats are based on the ratings from independent news monitoring organizations. What Ground News is offering here is an extremely valuable tool. No other website has anything remotely like it. I can't recommend this website enough. Go to ground.news slash Caspian to try out Ground News for free or subscribe to get unlimited access and support a small team of media outsiders working to make the news more transparent. Territory is like the sea. It ebbs and flows according to the forces of nature. Britain was once a remote colony of the Roman Empire, but eventually grew into a metropolis of a new empire. Meanwhile, Poland, the center of gravity in Eastern Europe, disappeared from the map when it was divided in three by its hostile neighbors. Still later, East Prussia turned from the seat of an empire into a remote colony. Empires and nations come and go. Russia is no exception. It collapsed twice before in the 20th century. Interestingly, not by guns and steel from without, but by friction and corruption from within. And while another collapse is greatly exaggerated, the war in Ukraine has stripped bare Russia's internal mechanisms. No less than three distinct disastrous waves are coalescing that risk overpowering the machinery of the state. The first wave is the threat posed by a unified Western bloc. Throughout history, Russia's longest and bloodiest conflicts were fought against European powers ranging from the Black Sea to the Baltic Sea. For the longest time, the European continent remained divided along geopolitical lines. Russia was part of one coalition or the other. But the war in Ukraine has pushed everyone over the edge. The Western Bloc is almost unanimously united against Russia. This has never happened before, not against Russia at least. 
the combined economic, military and diplomatic resources of the Western Bloc outweigh those of Russia, many times over. Even if Russia gains territories in Ukraine, its security needs along the European front will remain exposed. Poland is on a military shopping spree, Germany has pledged to increase defense spending, Finland and Sweden have made up their minds to join NATO, and the United States now considers Ukraine a top priority in foreign policy. Talk about blowback. As military cooperation in Eastern Europe deepens in the coming years, Russia will come to rely on its nuclear arsenal as its primary deterrence. Whether that is enough to stop foreign powers from sponsoring proxy conflicts within Russia remains to be seen. The second wave stems from the economic war of attrition. With the sanctions in place, Russia is cut from the Western-based global financial system, including technology transfers and industrial goods. Access to capital has diminished and Moscow is likely to lose its share in the European energy market. Exporting crude oil and natural gas to India and China is possible, but the volume and revenue will not be the same. With the economic war of attrition in effect, industrial and scientific advances in Russia will slowly freeze. This will have profound consequences. Take the rail infrastructure as an example. Years ago, the state-owned Russian railways switched from roller bearings to cassette bearings. It was a technical decision that improved the overhaul life and reliability of its railroad cars. However, all the cassette bearing production plants in Russia are owned by foreign multinationals. Russian Railways is thus dependent on importing foreign components, and there's no going back. The entire country is glued together by an extensive rail network. Take out that infrastructure and you take out the backbone of the Russian Federation, since there is no other efficient way of transportation. The third wave is a crisis in statehood. Russia's socio-political landscape is not stable. It hasn't been stable since the 1990s. State institutions are riddled with corruption. The rule of law only applies to those who cannot afford to bribe their way out, and the imbalance of its political elite is enormous. All of this is hardly unique to the Russian state. It took the French over a century of multiple revolutions to get to the current stable political climate. Not all nations get it right the first time. In Russia, however, those previous breakdowns the 1917 revolution and the 1991 collapse are deeply ingrained in the Russian mindset. As a remedy, the Russian public has embraced stability as its most important pillar for political decision making. Stability at all costs has been the case since the disintegration of the Soviet Union. However, over the years, that same stability has started to crumble under its own weight. Russia's civil service and public administrations are too poorly organized to withstand the coming socio-political disaster. It goes without saying that these three waves are connected in non-linear ways. They form a perfect storm of social unrest, foreign intervention and economic collapse. The last time Russia faced such a basket of disasters was in the 1920s, when its statehood imploded from within. Russian history seems to be in a loop. The current situation could still go either way, but the aforementioned three waves stretch Russia's resources and institutions. So much so that Western policymakers are increasingly betting on the downfall of the Russian Federation. Now, when most people think of a hypothetical Russian revolution, they think of a collision between Putin and the public. The leading narrative is either a rebellion against Putin or a palace coup. Those scenarios may seem plausible until they're not. Regardless of how bad things get, Russians are unlikely to abandon Putin. According to Russian sociological research organization Livada Center, approval for Putin sits at 83%, which is an increase of more than 10% compared to the stats in January. Whatever the reasons, the majority of the Russian public approves of the war against Ukraine. So, a mass rebellion against Putin is unlikely. 
And yet, public grievances have to be expressed in one way or another. Instead of a palace coup or a revolution, we could see civil disobedience directed not against the central government, but against the local authorities. The thing is, Russia is not homogenous. While the political elite in Moscow can ignore social unrest, the regional governors cannot. When basic commodities become scarce, and when the quality of life diminishes, it will be the governors and mayors who will be blamed, not Putin or anyone else in the Kremlin. Regional leaders will be found guilty of everything, from corruption to treason to decadence. So, what is happening here and now is that Russia's regional authorities are stocking up on food supplies as much as possible. When resources become harder to come by, federal regions could start falling out of sync. They won't declare independence, but they will start acting in the best interests of their respective regions, even if that comes at the expense of other federal regions. Think of regional checkpoints, de facto embargoes, etc. That is how a hypothetical Russian collapse would go down. If the efficiency of Russia's rail infrastructure decreases, or if transportation is disrupted, de facto economic separatism could take shape. It would be a subtle change, no one would be shouting it from the rooftops. Case in point, self-preservation could steadily turn into tribal politics. By acting in the best interests of their respective regions, the regional authorities could end up breaking the norms. The Tatarstan Republic, for instance, could set up internal customs on its borders with neighboring federal subjects. At the same time, the Dagestan Republic could stop complying with Moscow's legislated sanctions and start importing and exporting according to its own needs. Frictions like these would be the first signs of internal decay, and the West would support this phase rather than prevent it. Eventually, economic separatism would turn into political separatism as the momentum builds. German, Polish, Ukrainian, Turkish, Chinese and Japanese officials could then start talking to the regional authorities, bypassing the lawmakers in Moscow. As more nations start negotiating with the regional leaders, new allies, markets and resources will become available which would spur even more decentralization of Russian power. All this remains unlikely, but not impossible. A thousand bushfires can take down an empire. Some of these regional states would be democratic and lean towards the West, others would turn to authoritarianism and come under the sway of China. Still some, especially in the Caucasus, would fall into conflict with each other while others like Kaliningrad, Karelia, Vladivostok and the Kuril Islands would look to join the nations to which they belonged before World War II. Some regions would become wealthy and others would see a decline in living standards. And still some, like in the Siberian territories, could depopulate. Without centralized and subsidized transportation of goods, Cities like Chelyabinsk, Novosibirsk, Yekaterinburg, Omsk and Krasnoyarsk could have difficulty meeting the needs of their populations. A collapsing Russia would be the greatest geopolitical project of the century. The ultimate danger stems from Russia's nuclear arsenal. Should the Russian chain of command collapse and the Russian territorial integrity break apart, it would be nearly impossible to secure all of Russia's nuclear sites. Non-state actors, rogue factions and regional warlords would seek to obtain nuclear components. Even a single, unaccounted nuclear weapon would be a catastrophe. An international task force would likely be set up in the aftermath of a collapsing Russia, but the nuclear question would present an extraordinary threat. Once more, the collapse of Russia remains unlikely. But if it does happen, it wouldn't go down the way Yugoslavia did. There wouldn't be a single revolution in the capital. Rather, Russia's collapse would mimic the subtle, silent downfall of the Spanish Empire with all its ethnic and geographic divisions. When Putin started the war, he planned to bury Ukrainian statehood. Now it seems he may have to dig two graves. I've been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report. All of our content is crowdfunded. 
If you want to be part of that network and gain access to some premium perks like early access, PDF files, etc., consider joining our platform on Patreon or the YouTube membership program. In any case, thank you for your time and Sahol.